What's really going on, everyone? Back again with another very special episode. We are continuing our candidate series. If you recall our last episode, we had Joshua Anthony, who was running to be the youngest elected official in Georgia. Now we have our own very unique special candidate who is running to be the first of very many things. Uh, so I am proud uh, to introduce Musab Ali. He made history by being the youngest uh, elected official in the history of Jersey City at the just the age of 20. Believe it or not, now he is 27. Now he's running for the mayor of Jersey City. He is just coming off being president of the Jersey City School Board. So now I will let him introduce himself formally. Mr. Ali, how are you today? Hey, Noah, thank you guys for having me. Um, it's uh, it's actually amazing to think about that it's been seven years since I first got elected. Um, and even longer. I mean, I was actually 19 years old when I first ran for office. So it's actually been eight full years uh, since I first got involved in political advocacy and you know, it just, it really just flown by. As someone who is 28 turning 29, I could not have imagined being that serious at the age of 19 to actually being able to do that, but I'm sure we will get into that. So for those who need a little bit uh, of background, uh, Mr. Ali, he immigrated to the United States of America from Pakistan at a young age. He is a graduate of Rutgers University, and he also received a JD from Harvard University. So to kick off our questioning, you've been in public service, like we said, since the age of 20. What perspective has that given you? Like I said, most 20-year-olds and most college kids can't even think about saying, hey, I want to be so serious to the point that I run for elected office. At that age, at 19, even younger, what made you want to say, you know what, public service is the path that I want to take? Yeah, so it's interesting. I, um, I actually started off as pre-med. Um, my plan was to go to medical school. And, you know, my parents uh, were very deliberate about putting me in all the pre-med courses, all the science courses. Um, and I and I did think I was going to go into medical school. I mean, when I was in college, I was a double major in biology and economics, was taking the organic, organic chemistry, doing all those sorts of things. And, um, you know, there was this moment that I remember, which is, you know, growing up in Jersey City, post 9-11, um, I remember my dad, he got fired from his job uh, just because of his name. And my mom, she wears the hijab. And I remember she used to take the bus to school. And for three years, no one sat next to her on the school bus, right? That's what 9-11 kind of did uh, to my community. That's how it felt at home. And when Trump was running for office, he has this quote about Jersey City. And he says, I remember seeing thousands and thousands of Muslims cheering on the rooftops of Jersey City, New Jersey during 9-11. And this is 2015. You know, I'm in college and I'm just like, shocked that someone is saying this about my city, about my hometown, and about my community directly. Um, and so I had this like urge to do something. And, you know, it's ironic, because I think if I had known other politicians, I probably would have volunteered for a campaign, right, kind of like support somebody. I knew nothing about politics, right? Like, I was completely ignorant to the whole game. So I was like, okay, you know what, like, I, I should just run, like, I should run for something, like, what makes sense, uh, I decided to run for school board. Um, and the reason the 19 year old campaign isn't mentioned as much as I actually lost that election. So really sad day for me. So it's November, 2016, right? I'm on the ballot. I remember I went to sleep kind of early because I knew I lost, right? It was like a very early on. We had lost the election, I think two to one. Uh, so I go to bed and I wake up and Trump won, right? So this was like a really, really traumatizing day for me. Um, but you know, like I think after his election, I kind of, reassessed. And I was like, you know what, like it matters even more now for me to be involved, to be, for me to run. So ran again in 2017, got elected. Um, and you know, I, it really shifted my perspective on like what kind of influence we can have as young people. Right. I think so often people think that we're not ready to make these decisions, um, that we just don't have the, the intellect, uh, that we don't have the maturity, but some of the people that I was running against, I mean, did not know any of the facts, right? Like I remember right. our school board, we have a budget. At that time, our budget was around $676 million, right? I remember someone asking one of the board members, like how much money was in the budget. And they thought it was like $2 million. You know, and, and this was someone who won. This is someone who actually ended up getting on the school board, right? So I'm literally looking at myself like, I can do a better job. Like, just because I'm younger does not mean I'm not able to do this. Um, As, for the, for the it was funny that you mentioned that because... Um, our podcast started around 2016 with Henry and I, where I think it was literally after Trump's election. I think we said, like, we have to just do something. And we probably weren't as forward thinking as you in terms of we should actually run for office. But we said, you know what, we we have cheap podcast equipment. Let's do a podcast. So how did and I think that experience radicalized us to want to be able to have actually have a medium to be able to talk about these things with people like you. So how did that 
like you said, I think that was very much like a paradigm shift for everybody. How did that specifically kind of inspire you or also change your thinking of like, hey, I have to be the change now. Like, I can't rely on other people. I have to just do it now. How did that, how was 2016 yeah. kind of like a breaking point, whether traumatic or not, but talk a little bit yeah. about that. I, I think, I think particularly for my community, I thought about this idea that like, you know, especially as a young person, like so much of what was going to happen impacted us as young people. And we didn't have a voice in the system. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really was starting to think about this idea that like, the people who are the most impacted by some of the decisions that are being made do not have a seat at the table. And my campaign actually in 2016 was about forgotten stakeholders of education, right? I really, like, I remember saying this line of like, look, when you talk about education, like we'll talk to teachers, we'll talk to principals, we'll talk to parents, we'll talk to everyday taxpayers, but no one's actually asking students how they feel about their education. No one's going to them and thinking about, you know, what are the sorts of things that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis? And my whole idea was like, why don't we just empower young people to actually be involved in that process and to actually talk about the things that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis? When you talk about education, <clears throat> excuse me, we've recently seen an attack on like diversity, equity, inclusion, especially in the education sector. How do you think that, you know, as if you're elected mayor, how do you think that you'll be able to assist or play a role into combating those things that are stopping these diversity, equity, and inclusion programs from schools? Yeah. And actually, I want to follow up on that. I remember one of the most viral tweets we've seen in the last month uh, was when the bridge fell in Baltimore. Right. And they, the mayor, who actually is a friend of mine, I know him, I knew him when he was on the city council. Um, they were like, oh, yeah, the, it's, the, it's the DEI mayor. Right. Like for some reason, assuming that, you know, it was because of diversity that he was elected into a position overseeing a city's budget. Like it just it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think that the attack really is this sort of pushback from the right, uh, which is really sort of emphasizing this idea that they don't like the fact that people of color, minorities are like getting elected into positions of power, the fact that they're qualified for these positions, right? Um, and so I think it's, you know, redoubling our efforts and saying like, look, diversity is important to us. It's one of our strengths. Jersey City for me, the reason it was so valuable for me growing up there, it's the most diverse city in America, right? So this is like a, a wallet hub statistic that's that's sort of been given to us that we've been the most diverse city, city in America, I think for like 12 years or something. But oh, wow. what that meant for me was, as I was growing up, like people came from all over the world, right? Like everyone had a different background. Even today, 46% of Jersey City is foreign born. 46%, right? So not only are you super diverse, these are like first generation, second generation immigrants who are in this town, like really building the city, part of the culture, like the community, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you got to grow up in this world where being a minority like it didn't really feel like you were a minority, right? Because everyone's a minority. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, that was so powerful because our voices, I think were elevated because it wasn't about like the way that you looked or who you prayed to or any of that sort of thing. It was really like, okay, like, do we believe in your ideas, right? Like, do we think that you're the kind of person that should lead us? And it, it sort of like shifted the whole paradigm for me when I went to places like Harvard and I was surrounded in a place that wasn't a major majority minority place. I was kind of surprised like, oh, this is a very different feeling and feeling like, oh, you know, because of my background, people assume there's certain positives or negatives that are sort of associated with it. Yeah. Um, so that's why my city is so special. Quick aside before Henry gets to the next question, you obviously said that you and the mayor of Baltimore are friends. Is there like an under like certain age group elected official dem group chat where all of y'all are like, oh, yeah, I'm 22. I'm this person. I'm 20. Like, that's just very there, coincidental. There, there, actually I think I was like... there actually is. It's not a group chat. Actually, well, not everyone's in the group chat, but there's an organization called YEO. So it's called Young Elected Officials. Um, and it's a national network of everyone who's, I think it's 35 and under. It might be 30 and under. It might, some of them might be 35 and they just got in it too. But it's, I think it's 35 and under. If you've been elected to your first position at 35 and under, you get, you're part of this network. Um, so I think people like uh, Savante Myrick, who is the mayor of yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Pythica. You think about like Michael Tubbs. This is how yeah. I met Michael Tubbs. He's one of my yeah. mentors. Woodfin down in Alabama, all these folks. Are exactly. Imagine. Also, all of them are part of YEO, right? Like all of them are part of this network. So it's, it is like, it's not underground. It's a, it's like a public thing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of us are in that network. So are you going to walk around like in like seven years? Cause you'll still be under like, yo, I'm the most tenured person in here. Like yo, I'm the OG, like y'all got to bow to me. I think you, I think you have that right. I don't know about Mackenzie and Henry, but I think from like, I was here since I was 19. What about y'all? I, I don't know if I don't know if that's the way it works. And I also don't know if that's something that I want, right? Like, look, I think public service is great in terms yeah. of like a way to give back to your community. 
do I see myself as wanting to be a career politician? Like there's a lot of other things that, that matter to me right now. This is the most important thing. But I, I, before Henry gets his next question, it's interesting that you all have that group chat. And I think that that's a great tool. Yeah. To use. But I'm curious for a lot of people who are first in their families to do something is that does that having that group chat or having that conversation with other mayors who are somewhat like-minded as you, does that alleviate any pressures you might have when you're doing something like running for the mayor? I think it inspires you in a way like when, because I think that it is really hard to be the first of anything, right? Like yeah. there's this whole idea of like, if you can't see something, you can't be that, be that thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for me to see people who have done it, right. Especially minorities. I think Michael Tubbs' story, especially is so fantastic. Michael Tubbs has a book. Uh, it's called The Deeper the Roots. He talks about his whole upbringing. And he first got elected to city council when he was 22 years old. All right. He became the mayor of his town, which is over 300,000 people, when he was 26 years old. One of the first people to write him a check actually was Oprah Winfrey. I mean, he has an incredible story about a, sto a, a city that actually went through bankruptcy that selected him as the mayor. And, you know, he was the one that started the whole, um, like, uh, the freedom dividend, right, that Andrew Yang talks about, right, this whole idea mm -hmm. of like universal basic income, UBI, Michael yeah. Tubbs is the one that piloted that program in his town. He was the first one to ever do it. And so when everyone talks about UBI, like Stockton, California was like the birthplace of that idea. And I think the only reason you can do something like that is when you're a young mayor and he had went to Stanford, he had connections with people who were in Silicon Valley, who were willing to fund this project, right? So it's this idea of being able to think outside the box and understanding for me, like, yeah, there's some people who are going to look at me. I'm going to be 28 during the election and say, look, like you're really young. Can you do this job? And I can point to someone like, like Mayor Tubbs and say, look, he was 26. And look at all the fantastic things he was able to do for his community. Right. So I think that's the way it really helps out. Um, and it helps us to like, believe that, like, you know what, we can do it too. I really love that. And I love how like, just you're dropping a lot of gems. Um, as a proud Muslim man, what would it mean for you to be the city's first Muslim mayor, especially considering the crises we have at large in the world? Yeah, I think um, this issue is in particular, it's like I, the first reason I ran, right, was to be the first Muslim in any position here, right? And like Muslims have a very long history in Jersey City. We've been here for a very, very long time. I would say somewhere between 10 to 12% of the city is Muslim. Um, but I remember like, Post 9-11, right, we actually had the NYPD infiltrating into our mosques. We had the NYPD who infiltrated into our student groups. We had the NYPD who infiltrated into, like, all different parts of our of our lives. And so the response from our community actually was to, like, keep your head down, right? Like, you didn't get involved in politics. You didn't get involved in public life because you just never really knew who to trust. You never really knew, like, you know, who was looking out for you, sort of all, the, all those sorts of things. Um, and so I think it'd be, like, a very full circle moment. For me to have come to this country as a young person, um, like in the shadow of 9-11, and to then go on to become the mayor of my town. And when you talked about NYPD coming into your education groups and stuff like that, literally today I saw Columbia had NYPD, and I know Columbia is in New York and it's separate, but I am curious as a Rutgers graduate, are you concerned about that possibly kind of happening in your neck of the woods? Look, I think the the crackdown of free speech, particularly related to Palestine, uh, is something that I think should trouble everybody. Um, I mean, this Columbia issue is just the latest in like a string of things that's been happening, right? I mean, most recently you had the student at USC um, mm -hmm. who was selected as the valedictorian and, yeah. you know, as a biomedical engineering major, by the way, right? Like tough degree to get. 4.0 was selected a valedictorian and had the speech taken away from her before they even saw her speech, right? They had no idea what she was going to talk about. But the fact that she was a Muslim woman who had been involved in Palestinian advocacy, like for safety concerns, they took away her ability to speak. Um, you know, in Jersey City, like I had been involved with pro-Palestine events from the very beginning, right? Like this was something that was very important to me because I saw this as an issue that was, you know, a, an issue centered around justice. And so I felt like I couldn't stay quiet about it. And I know that even myself, like I face backlash from people who have been like, oh, like, you know, this person's anti-Semitic, this person's calling for hate speech. Um, even when I announced my mayoral campaign, actually, I remember one of the headlines of like how they presented my article uh, was they were like, you know, Ali used to be the former president of the Board of Education. And most recently, he's advocate for a cease symbolic ceasefire resolution between the Israeli forces and the terrorist organization Hamas, right? 
like deliberately painting it as though I'm a terror sympathizer, right? Like this is this is exactly how it's sort of being presented. So, you know, this is an issue that I think should trouble people across the country. Um, and it's something that like, I know I'm going to be facing throughout this campaign, but it's something that like, look, I, I believe that I'm on the right side of history and, um, you know, you just got to double down there. No, I appreciate you like sharing that, especially being a member of like the Muslim community. Uh, how like has, you kind of maybe mentioned it earlier, but how has the Muslim community responded uh, to your announcement and like some of the, you know, efforts you've taken to kind of support the community? Yeah, I think it's been uh, it's been really exciting. I think for a lot of people in our community, uh, right, to have some like to have someone from our community sort of step up, because I can remember before I was on the board of ed, you know, we didn't even have, have the Eid holiday as like a holiday, right? So mm -hmm. you you go back to 2015, 2015, the board of education does not approve Eid as a holiday in Jersey City. You fast forward a couple of years, at 23 years old, I'm the I'm the president of the school school board as a Muslim American, right? So. There's just so much of a shift that I think has happened. And then, you know, we felt like we were making all this progress. Then everything happens with the, you know, after October 7th. And then suddenly it just feels like our community is under attack once again, right? That for some reason, like those of us that are advocating for peace, right? Like we're advocating for an end to the killing that's taking place. Like somehow we're seeing again, like with the same moniker, it was like, you know, terror sympathizers, uh, people who are being uh, seen as anti-Semitic. I mean, it's just... You know, it's sort of these repeated attacks that come over and over again. And like, you know, I think that that's something it's unavoidable. I remember in 2016 was the first time I really saw it start to flare up. And it's it's ironic, right? Like um, we made our thing, we made our announcement on Twitter separately. And one of the first hate comments we got was about Sharia law, right? Like, are you going to have Sharia law? And I remember that being the exact same thing that they had said to me. 2016, right? Of like, if you get elected, will you implement Sharia law? And so it's like, you know, it just, it just keeps repeating. I, wow. I mean, I think it's, it's amazing to, I think, think about just how, you know, candidate black and brown candidates, especially those of, you know, diverse groups, just that everyday interaction, um, people just don't even think about that in terms of like the things that are asked that are ignorant, uninformed, that you still didn't have to give a proper response to. Um, can you talk about that? I mean, because I'm sure that that has to be infuriating to say, like, you're you're just seeing my name or you're seeing what you think I am and asking the most ridiculous question. How do you actually kind of put on your, hey, I'm this is who I am without actually kind of getting caught up in the probably the personal response that you would want to have, to be honest? How do you balance that? I, I think that politics requires a lot of patience. Um, like you, you know, you understand that you're going to be dealing with a lot of people that, you know, some are coming with nefarious intent. Some of them are just generally ignorant. Um, but I, I just think you have to be patient about it, right? You can't let things get to you personally. Um, you have to just remind yourself like, look, I'm here fighting for a greater good. I'm fighting for a greater cause. And like letting them make you angry is like letting them win. Right. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a quote that I love. That's like the best revenge is success. And for me, like, that's how I feel. Right. Like, if there are certain people out there that like hate Muslim Americans or hate people that are brown or hate people uh, that don't look like them, for me to be in a position of power, like I know that makes them even more angry, right? Like yeah. that's my success. Yeah. Pivoting gears a little bit, I know you've talked a lot about your work um, kind of in the education space, obviously in Jersey City with school board being the president there. Um, can you talk about some of your greatest accomplishments um, with your work with the school board? I think everyone kind of overlooks kind of the importance of education policy. So can you talk about you know, kind of some of your successes there when you were there? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest one I always think about is um, is when I was in elementary school, they shut down the water fountains in our school district because uh, they found lead in the water. And, you know, it took until I got onto the school board to actually start that lead remediation process to reopen all the water fountains in our school district. And so I remember like a year or two ago, I was at the park and there was this, um, there was a kid who was running around and he had just immigrated from Afghanistan. He was an Afghani refugee who had just come to Jersey City. And he actually went to the same elementary school that I went to. And I remember stopping him and asking him, I was like, do they have clean drinking water in your school system? And he was like, of course they do, right? And so for me, like that was the moment that like, it, that's the moment that we fight for, right? Like, sure, I didn't get that opportunity as a kid. And it like, it sucked that from the time I was in second grade till the time I graduated high school, we didn't have clean drinking water, which meant that, you know, if they ran out of those water coolers, like you were just out of luck. 
But for him to just have no second thought about the idea that like, of course, this is a reality of my system. Like that is what we should be fighting for, right? Like the basic necessities that kids should have, like they shouldn't be second guessing and they shouldn't be thinking about the credit, right? Like it's not about, oh my God, I was able to do that. Like every single water fountain should have my name on it. Like that's not what it's about, right? Like real public service is about, hey, how am I paying this forward so that the next generation has resources that I don't? Um, I mean, some of the other things we did, we we abolished student lunch debt, right? So there were certain kids that couldn't pay for lunch. We used to have a policy of like, you know, if you couldn't pay for lunch, like they would give you like a cheese sandwich or something. We abolished that. Like while I was there, we were able to pay off all the debt um, for all the students. We increased minimum wage for our teachers up to $61,000. So starting salary, the 61000 I think it's even, even higher now. Um, we were able to increase minimum wage for all of our employees to $17 an hour. Um, and those are just a couple of the things. I mean, we we did a whole bunch of things around like period poverty as well. Uh, we did things around um, uh, like healthcare reform. We had a lot of fiscal issues. I mean, the biggest thing also was like reopening schools, right? Like I was the pandemic president. So that meant like while I was there during COVID, nobody knew how to figure this thing out, right? Like, like every level of government sort of abdicated responsibility, right? The president was like, hey, I don't know what to do. Governors, you figure it out. Governors were like, hey, I don't know what to do like cities you figured out, right? And so it came down to our level where we were making decisions, honestly, about life or death. Like it really did feel that way um, without any of these those resources and sort of navigating that. So, you know, we had some tough challenges. One follow-up I wanted to ask you on that. I think um, I think you would be uniquely positioned to answer this as someone involved in the school board. Um, it seems to be like there was really a big effect on, you know, children from, you know, lower economic backgrounds and diverse backgrounds during the pandemic that didn't have, you know, like you said, that access to food, like, you know, to those in wider community. Can you talk about at least how your work tried to be at least kind of forward thinking into the communities that you're already tapped into because you're from it? Can you talk about how that that had to be really, really challenging work? And I don't think we talk about that enough of how the pandemic affected different groups of different, you know, religions, socioeconomic ones, but often the ones that are lower and blacker and browner impacted more than let's say you know your white constituents in jersey city can you talk about that because i think that's a really under examined aspect of the pandemic of just how certain communities were a lot more impacted especially at a young age yeah i actually think even before we get to that from like a district-wide perspective right so we're a my majority minority district like we have a lot of title one dollars which means that you have a lot of low-income students who are part of your district it was way tougher for us to get laptops than some of my sister districts which actually yeah. meant that for months, like I had kids that did not have a single device at home that they could use. Well, like my sister districts were able to purchase those those pieces of equipment, right? Which is like already shows you the imbalance that exists, right? Like yeah. we're a poor district. And so we're not able to get the same resources as a richer district where like they can fundraise, they can get these laptops. These kids will all have access to internet. We had kids who like, I remember there were families, I'm talking about five families sharing one, like five people in one family sharing a laptop. I mean, that's just not sustainable when you're thinking about education, you're thinking about like eight hours of instruction, you're thinking about like what these kids are are, are trying to go after. So um, we tried really hard on like the food part to make sure that we actually had a system in place where we would have uh, drop off points and school buses on whole different locations. And we would give, I think, more than like up to a week of food that we would drop off to people, right? So we tried to be very intentional about like making sure that we were still having that infrastructure in place so that kids could still get fed. Um but I do think you you notice like there was a significant slide. We talked about the education slide that existed. So it's like this extension of the summer slide, which is already a problem that we see between like different socioeconomic statuses, right? So the summer slide basically is, is a phenomenon where, you know, wealthier kids tend to go into these summer enrichment programs. And so they're continuing to get their education. They're continuing to sort of like stay on level or like level up. But, you know, children who don't get those resources sorry about that. So children who go don't get those resources, like they don't, they don't have the same access. Right. And so they have a summer slide where they're walking into their next school year and they're not at the same level that they were. And so now they're already playing catch up and then they're behind those kids that got those summer enrichment programs. Right. So education, I could, I could talk about it for a long time. It's uh, <laughs> it, there are a ton of, ton of issues. Um, but part of what inspired me to run for mayor was I remember being on the school board and, you know, 10% of our students actually were um, were homeless, right? Like we're considered homeless. Like they didn't have to actually have a place to go um, to sleep every single night. They were, they were uh, insecure in terms of housing. And I remember thinking to myself, like, you know, in a school district, I can only control the eight hours that they're in my school district. 
but what happens all those hours outside of my school district, right? And how can I be involved in the resources and those wraparound services when it comes to housing insecurity, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to transportation, right? Like how can we also be involved in that aspect? And those are functions that are city and state functions. Um, and so I started to think more and more about, you know, how I could be involved at a larger scale. And, and that's when, you know, running for mayor sort of became the thing uh, that I set my eyes on. So looking ahead, then what are some of what would you say is Jersey City's biggest challenge and something that you would try to um, take charge of um, when you're elected mayor? So I, I think the biggest thing is affordability. Um, you know, at one point, Jersey City actually had the highest rent in the country, which is insane, right? Like the place where I grew up, I mean, was not a place that rent could have gone as high as it did. Um, but you have so many variances that took place in our master plan when it comes to zoning, when it comes to building, where almost every new development was luxury condos, right? And I mean, for anyone who takes the path train, like you see the the advertising all the time, right? It's all about, hey, here's this new unit has a 30 year tax payment. Here's this new unit that has this new tax payment. Um, and like, I'm not against growth. Like I actually think a healthy city is a growing city, but at the same time, it's about equitable growth, right? Like how are you making sure there's workforce housing? How are you making sure that there's affordable housing? How are you making sure that there's no loopholes where developers can sort of buy out of their like affordable housing requirements, right? So we started an inclusionary zoning ordinance here in Jersey City, but I think it still hasn't incentivized developers properly to actually build those affordable housing units. Um, so I think really being intentional about how are we focusing on affordability? How are we making sure the numbers work so that developers are actually you know pitching in to make sure that every unit that they're building, that there's counterparts that are also building affordable units uh, for people that are from Jersey City, the people that want to stay in Jersey City. Um, I think the other big thing is sustainability, right? Like we're a city that's on the coastline um, and I don't see people really talking about how important climate change is for cities like Jersey City, right? Like we are at risk dramatically from a lot of the flooding that's already taking place. Um, and we have to be very we have to be very intentional about the decisions that policymakers are making as we think about it being a city of the future. And I think the last thing I think, especially education, like, you know, has been something that I focus a lot about. And I think the city can play a big role when it comes to that economic development, when it comes to those pipelines. We also know that college isn't for everybody. We know that that's starting to become more and more of reality as like college prices continue to go up. So how are we building in that workforce? How, like how are we building in that, that workplace where, you know, kids are graduating from our high schools going directly into apprenticeship programs for companies that are here in Jersey city and can remain here in Jersey city. Right. I mean, like these are opportunities that you need to explore with partnerships across these avenues. Um, and I think I'm like well positioned to understand them. It's cool that you speak about housing affordability and overall like development and gentrification that may be happening in Jersey city. What like proactive changes would you uh, make to support uh, these efforts? So I, I think the first thing is, again, making sure we close the loopholes on inclusionary zoning ordinances um, so that developers aren't, you know, sort of saying that they're going to build something, but then actually going ahead and building luxury units and trying to do a, a buyout where they ask government to build affordable housing. The government is not good at building affordable housing. I mean, that's something that we have seen throughout history. Like when we talk about the projects, like that is government affordable housing, and it has almost never been successful, right? So you have to think about a new model of mixed income housing. You have to think about a model where people are able to live together from different income groups um, so that these communities are supporting one another. I think the other thing you have to think about is being very intentional on making sure that developers are buying into the idea of like what the master plan already is, right? So every couple of years, a city builds out a master plan of like what they want the future to look like, right? Like, what, do you, what are you planning to do? This is like your planning department, your zoning department, they work together to sort of, sort of come up with this like neighborhood approach. The problem is developers will come in, they'll purchase certain properties and they'll say, hey, I want a variance. And a variance is something that varies from the master plan that exists. And so they'll say, look, like I know I can only build five units here. I want to build 15 units here, right? And so the question becomes, when you do a variance, what is the give back that you're giving to the community, right? Like, how are you making sure that this is something that's still sustainable, that's still equitable so that people from that community are still getting a community benefit? And I think that's been something that's been lacking in our city. Um, but I think gentrification is a, it's a much larger problem, right? I mean, I think there's also questions around housing uh, and ownership, right? Like, how are you building out programs where more people can be homeowners? How are you building out programs so that more and more people can have access to like rent controlled units? 
Um, we recently passed a right to counsel in Jersey City so that people would actually get tenants if they're being evicted. Uh, to, people who are being evicted will actually get representation. But, you know, I, I just think there's so much to do on the housing front. Um, and unfortunately, our city's sort of been falling behind. Yeah. So now we're going to pivot, um, you know, before we close out, we always like to kind of finish off on a fun note. So we're kind of just going to each kind of go around with kind of a little bit of a rapid fire. Obviously, like you said you immigrated here um, from Pakistan to start it off just kind of, I think, on a culture thing for myself and our audience. Um, what is your favorite Pakistani food? My favorite Pakistani food is balakosht, which is like spinach and meat. Um, mm -hmm. And my mom is the best chef in the world at that. So. Do you have and do you have a favorite Pakistani restaurant either in or in Jersey City or in New York that you recommend that Mackenzie try out and myself when I go to to New York next week? The problem is in Jersey City, if I name one, I don't know if the other <laughs> ones would get get a you spot, But you know what? There's one very accessible. There's one very accessible, which is if you get off the path train of Grove Street, right across from City Hall, there's a place called Lari Adda. Um, mm -hmm. and at that spot, I would recommend you try something called Nihari. It's like, a, it'd be a very new dish for you. It's like beef. Uh, it's called beef Nahari. Um, highly recommend it. So if I hit them up to sponsor our next episode, let them know you sent us, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what like motivates you when you're ready to go out, give a speech? What, 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 how do you prepare for that? Oh man, I don't know. I think I'm just built different, you know? Like it's just in me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think I've always just been someone who's like, I've had a lot of energy like on Sunday, this past Sunday, I did a marathon and then we did our rally for our campaign, like, in, like separated by like two hours. Um, and so for me, it's kind of, I kind of like always have this drive where like I wake up and I'm like ready to go. Um, I don't know. That's, that's just always been something that I've had. I mean, even from when I was young, I remember doing a million things at the same time and just never running out of energy. You don't even listen to music at all or anything. I don't, I don't actually drink, I don't drink any coffee. Um, so no caffeine. Music I'll listen to occasionally, but like, it's not my motivator. <laughs> okay. So then now I'm like hesitant to ask this question. Um, are you watching any TV shows you would recommend? Any TV shows I'd recommend? Um, I do watch some TV shows. I mean, I'll say, I think, let's see. I really enjoyed Billions. Uh, I know Billions has ended, but Billions I thought was like a really good sort of like drama where like the law and money really come together. And it's based on a true story, which I think is like an incredible like backdrop to it. That's funny. I have literally three episodes of it left. So I'm literally finishing it out and I'm very eager to see how it ends. Um, book that, or book recommendations, favorite books that you read recently or all time? One of my favorite all time books, uh, the author passed away recently, uh, Daniel Kahneman. He writes his book called Thinking Fast and Slow. So it created a new field in economics. Uh, it created this whole new field called behavioral economics, which like transformed the way that we think about how people make decisions. Um, economics is based on this idea that people are rational, but we all know that people are not rational, right? Like people don't make decisions rationally all the time. And Kahneman really tries to explore that. He won the Nobel Prize for it, uh, recently passed away, but love that book. Well, I'm, I'm taking notes on the recommendations here, just to let you know. Uh, so if you have... I don't want to ask this now because you don't listen to music. What's most exciting about running for mayor, uh, especially in a city like Jersey City? I think what's most exciting is like, it's my hometown. And I think like, you know, there's this, there's a thing about being in your hometown and having this opportunity that I think is really exciting. Um, but I think it's also really exciting, like inspiring other people, right? Like I think I meet young people all the time who tell me that, you know, they've been more involved in public life or they've seen themselves as like, have the ability to be involved in this world because of the work that I've done. Um, and to me, like to be that inspiration for other people, just like people have been like before me, it really, for me, feels like this idea of like, you know, carrying the baton and passing it on to the next generation. Right. Because I, I really think as we look at our leaders across this country, I mean, I think we need young, new, fresh ideas sort of carrying forward. You're on mute, Mackenzie. Oh, sorry. When you talk about um, passing the baton, who was that for you? I I think in Jersey City, it'd be tough for me to... It doesn't have to be in Jersey City. It could be just um, everyone. Well, I, but I actually think, you know, the people who inspired me to like actually really, really get involved, I think were my parents and I got to give them a lot of credit. Um, my parents are both public service workers. Like my mom's a teacher. My dad worked for the postal service. And so like, you know, they didn't have 
flashy jobs. They weren't working, you know, in corporate, like they were just everyday public servants who like every day went to work, did the job, came home and, and just continued to give back to their community. And I think that sort of like career path helped inspire me to say, you know what, like this is something that I could pursue too. That concludes our rapid fire. And when you do say that you are built different audience, I want uh, you to know that uh, our guest is actually a survivor of stage four Hopkins lymphoma. So built different is actually probably the word to describe it. Um, so as always, um, how can folks get connected with you? How can they get connected with your campaign for our folks who are in the Jersey area? How can they, you know, get in contact with you to both, you know, donate, but also support, uh, knock on doors with you? So how, you know, just how can folks get in contact with you, you know, on the website, but also through social media? Yeah. So Ali2025.com. Um, that's our, that's our, it's our website. It's very easy to get to. Um, and also on Instagram where Ali for JC, I think on X it's Musab Ali JC, but we got to like consolidate our socials. It's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be all the same, but Ali for JC on most of them. And then our website is Ali2025.com. You can find everything else there. Awesome. So thank you so much uh, for being our amazing special guest. We look forward to watching you and watching you win in 2025. So that concludes this episode of the What's Really Going On podcast. Be sure to check out this video and more on all of our streaming platforms. That includes Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts, Audio Edition. You can also watch uh, fun little videos like this in full and our special clips and shorts on YouTube. Be sure to check us out on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at WRGOPod. Thank you.